Buddhist Memorial Lecture. Uh, today, this lectureship was established at the University of Illinois through memorial gifts by family and friends uh, with a major contribution by the, the Digital Equipment Cor Corporation. Okay, so, um, so our, our Donald B. Gillis Memorial Lecturer today is Mike. Um, Mike needs no introduction, so I'm going to try to keep this short. Um, Mike is one of the founding members of the field of database systems. Uh, he's currently a faculty member at MIT after having had uh, spent many years at UC Berkeley. Mike built one of the first database systems that is built on top of the relational model called Ingress in the 1970s, building on top of a theoretical paper by Edgar F. Cord, who was another Turing Award winner. Since then, Mike has revolutionized the database research, uh, both database research and database industry, time and time again, with a number of influential database systems, uh, Postgres, CStore, HStore, uh, SciDB, and so on. And he's still active, and he's still going strong. So Mike is the recipient of the 2015 Turing Award, which is the greatest honor given to computer scientists. He was the Sigmod Edgar uh, F. Cord Innovations Award winner in 1992, and the IEEE John von Neumann uh, Neumann Award in, uh, winner in 2005. Most importantly, Mike is known to be refreshingly candid in his viewpoints. Um, so I have no doubt that today's talk will both delight and entertain all of you. Welcome, Mike. Uh, thank you, Adidya. Uh, when it warms up enough, I will take this coat off. Uh, so I'm here today to give a. You have something? Uh, I'm here today to give a dry run of a uh, of a keynote talk that I'm going to give to the Data Engineering Conference next week in Paris. So I hope you guys will react as hostily as possible. Uh, throw rotten tomatoes, or I guess out here you throw corn husks or what, whatever. Anyway, uh, this is not going to be your traditional uh, lecture at all. Uh, if you're expecting technical content, uh, there isn't going to be any. I instead, th this is going to be a bunch of things that I'm worried about a lot. And so it's my 10 fears about the future of the database field, with apologies to David Letterman. So what I'm going to talk about is three very big fears, and then five more that kind of result directly from the biggies. And then I'm going to talk about what I call the big enchilada, which is really two fears that I think uh, you know, supersede everything. So that's what we're going to do today. The, uh, I'll just leap right into what my fears are. Uh, the first one I call the hollow middle. Uh, I have a lot of gray hair, so I've been around for a while. And I was around in 1977, which was 41 years ago. And if you looked at what the database field, the researchers were interested in 40 years ago, uh, you know, storage structures, query processing, they're trying to get relational database systems to work. And there were a bunch of ideas that revolved around how to build data managers. And that was kind of what the field was defined to be 40 years ago by uh, what was in conferences, publications back then. So if you just count the percentage of Sigmod papers that deal with this core uh, set of stuff over time. Well, in 1977, it was all. And then since then, it's been slowly declining to where now it's about a little less than half of the papers uh, you know, in, Sig in Sigma Conference that deal with the core database system stuff. Uh, what do you conclude from this? Well, as a research field, we are drifting into what used to be called applications. And, and this, I guess, is, is natural, which is the core 
has become increasingly well understood. The amount of research terrain in the core you know, is declining. And so uh, people have to publish or perish. So they move one layer out into what used to be called applications. That's perfectly natural. But the thing that I find kind of a little bit scary is that the various applications that people worry about have very little to do with each other. So if you're worried about text or natural language processing or search, well, you know, there's one set of stuff you work on. Uh, if you're worried about autonomous vehicles, which is you know, a big deal these days, well, you worry about a very different set of stuff. And if you're interested in complex analytics, uh, the most popular, which right now happens to be machine learning, then you're interested in how to make matrix multiply go fast you know, in, in current hardware. So these have very little to do with each other. And so I'm reminded of uh, 35 years ago in 1981, I think, uh, Sigmod, and in fact, I was the head of Sigmod when this happened. Uh, the theoreticians and the other people in doing database had a divorce. And so the pods guys uh, divorced from Sigmod, I think in 1981, 1982, around there. Basically, the, the research community bifurcated, and they bifurcated for a very simple reason. All the rest of us couldn't understand any of these theory papers and said, how are we supposed to accept them? We can't figure out what they're talking about. And the theory guys were really pissed that their papers were getting rejected by people who couldn't understand them. So it made perfect sense for the theory guys to go off and do their own thing have their own sandbox. The rest of us you know, continued without the theory guys, and things worked fine for quite a while. So basically, that was a bifurcation. The field split. I mean, I think it wasn't in half, but back then it was maybe one third, two thirds. And it split on the basis of being able to understand each other's stuff. So essentially, what's, in my opinion, what's happening in the database field right now is a multifurcation, which is these various application areas pretty much have nothing to do with each other. And people in one application area don't understand what's going on in another application area. It's basically the same kind of thing that happened 35 years ago, but it's not two people splitting it's going to be six or seven people splitting. So pictorially, if you want to look at this, in 1977, if you drew a round circle around what people worked on, uh, and then you looked again uh, 40 years later, uh, pretty much the things we worked on in 1977 are in the process of going away, which is the middle is, is disappearing and being replaced by a bigger circle around the outside, which is why I call this the hollow middle. So we're moving into a world in the database community, in my opinion, which is pictorially the, the hollow middle. So the conclusion I draw is our research community is moving to a world where nothing binds us together except a couple hundred researchers who agree to look favorably on each other's papers sometimes. So in my opinion, we are absolutely ripe to say, it's time to formally multifurcate. Let's have multiple PCs in these various areas. The multiple PCs can understand each other's papers. Uh, and that way, things, in my opinion, will work better simply do what we did in 1981 and do it sort of maybe five or six ways instead of two ways. Otherwise, I'm pretty sure that the practical systems guys will declare a divorce and leave. So I think the current situation is untenable. So they will probably leave and start their own conference. And that, I think, is the consequences of the current state of the world. 
So anyway, so we should realize that we've all moved into applications and the applications don't have much to do with each other. A huge fear that I have is that we have been abandoned by what I will call our customer. So 40 years ago, Sigmod was alive and well. And industry types, meaning people whose job was to build database systems or use database systems to solve real world problems, industry types came to our conferences. And they were pathfinders from all kinds of early application areas, financial services, oil and gas, all that kind of stuff. And they were looking for DBMS solutions to real world problems. They participated in panels, program committees, and by and large, they kept us honest. And they were our customer. And the basic idea way back when was to make our customer happy. And that was, in my opinion, what, what defined the database field was the desire to, make some, to solve somebody's problem. Fast forward 40 years, and industry types have disappeared from our conferences completely. You ask, why are they not there? Uh, the answer is pretty obvious, because our conferences are no longer relevant to their needs. So there's two answers to who's replaced them. One is nobody, which is we are now just talking to ourselves. Or at best, you can say they've been replaced by representatives of the folks who I'll call the whales. Uh, that's people like Google, Amazon, Microsoft, you know, those guys, Facebook. And I'll have a, the next slide talks about the whales, but there, no one can make the argument that they're representative of DBMS users. They represent a fantastic outlier, uh, you know, 0.01% of users or some such thing. So as a field, we become disconnected from the real world. And in my opinion, this is a, an extremely dangerous state of affairs. You started with a field which defined itself as solving somebody's problem, and now you're not solving anybody's problem. Or at best, you're dealing with the problem of the whales. Obviously, let's get, get the customer back. If you've lost your customer, get him back. So what about the whales? So if you look at Google, Amazon, Facebook, dot, 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 they're inhabited by IT professionals who are way smarter than the average bear. So they hire very smart people. Uh, in talking to folks this morning, it's, all, it's very clear they all have a not invented here syndrome. So they all build rather than buy stuff for a variety of reasons. They have their own unique needs. And until recently, they knew nothing about database systems. So they're hardly an exemplar of a database customer. So for us to, as a research community to say, uh, our job in life is to make the whales happy I mean, they're not, they're, not a real, they're not a real customer, they're outliers. And of course, if you're not making the whales happy, then the alternative is we're not making anybody happy, at which point we're just making up stuff for ourselves. Dangerous state of affairs. So that's fear number two, is that we've been abandoned by our customer. Fear number three, which is, I think, an absolute killer. Uh, I got a PhD from a university you know, up the road. Uh, and my, at 1971, I graduated, and I had zero publications. Zero. That's Z-E-R-O. <laughs> Five years later, I got tenure from Berkeley, another you know, not too shabby institution. And 
My resume in 1976 had about five papers on it. And others in my peer group, you know, like Dave DeWitt has similar numbers. So back then, a PhD was called write a thesis and you, know, you, can, you can graduate with zero publications. Five years later, you're expected to write a few papers. So that was then. Let's look at now. Uh, I look at a lot of uh, assistant professor applications. Uh, most of them have ordered 10, ten papers. <coughs> if you have less than 10 papers, then people say, why? And if you come up for tenure, tenure case should have order 40 papers. That's the kind of tenure, that's the kind of tenure material I see, which is both numbers are up by an order of magnitude over what was true 50 years ago. So there's, you're expected to write 10x the number of papers, and they're around 10x the number of researchers, which is to say the number of papers in the DBMS field is up by a factor of 100 or so. And nobody can keep up with this deluge. You know, there's just diarrhea of the papers. And this has all kinds of bad effects. So first of all, absolutely everybody divides their papers into least publishable units. Why do they do that? Well, it's pretty obvious. <clears throat> You've got to have 40 papers in your resume uh, to get tenure. That's five a year. Uh, to generate 40 papers, you better cut up your ideas into things that will generate a lot of papers. So the result is lots of least publishable units. Very few seminal papers which basically contributes to this deluge. And if you're a database aficionado, I'd like to challenge you to name a seminal paper in the last 10 years. I mean, I really can't. So if you know of one that I somehow didn't read, please let me know. Don't, you don't have to raise your hand, just send me email. So there's a ton of least publishable units and we all do it. Now, if you're a student getting a PhD, you're faced with the following facts of life. You need order 10 papers to get an assistant professor position. You know, you've got three or four productive years to do it because, you know, the first year is pretty much lost. And so if you have to grind out two and a half papers a year, any serious implementation just takes way too much time. So you've got to focus on quickies, you've got to focus on incrementalism, and theory papers are way faster to write than papers where you have to muck around with real data. And so it tilts us toward theory papers, it tilts us toward quickies, and anything serious takes too much time. Now, a long time ago, uh, I wrote Postgres, so I didn't write it. 39 Berkeley students wrote it. And a bunch of them were PhD candidates. And it would, be, it would be essentially impossible in today's publication climate to have ever written Postgres because it was way too much work. The students who wrote Postgres could not produce 10 papers in four years because implementation that we did was took way too much time. So the fact that you need a ton of papers means you can't do anything serious and you've got to focus on incrementalism. And that's just, in my opinion, too bad. So where did this come from? Uh, why did we move from zero to 10? Why did we move from five to 40? Who said that's a good idea? Uh, and it seems to me, if you want to point a finger, uh, lazy administrators often in the Far East uh, are responsible for just counting papers. But I think all of us share some of the blame. 
which is we've allowed the system to, to come into existence where you just have to write a diarrhea, you know, diarrhea of papers. And my fear is it's just getting worse. Every year it seems to get worse. And so I think this is a, a serious, serious problem, at least in the database field. So I have a couple of solutions. My, my first and best solution uh, is to say, take the you know, take the top 20 US universities and get every department chairman, one is here, uh, to just say, if you're gonna send us an application for an assistant professor position, I don't wanna see more than three papers on that application. If you send me an application with more, I'm just gonna send it back and ask you to send in only three. So send in, send in only three papers if you're applying for an assistant professor position. If all the major universities do this, pretty quickly you guys would all write only three papers during your graduate career. In my opinion, that would be a really good idea. And tenure cases, well, you have to let them have a few more, maybe 10, but just plain restrict the number of papers you're gonna look at. And that will just knock down on how many papers we all write, which is, I think, would have just really good consequences. Are you taking questions? Do you want to take them? Sure, go ahead. So CRA came up with a best practice memo saying roughly what you just said not very long ago, maybe two, three years ago. It did not catch on. And it's been a source of frustration. Do you have comments on how to I mean, the question. the question is CRA, the Computer Research Association, said roughly this two or three years ago, and it didn't catch on. And so how, how do you actually make this happen? Uh, the answer is I'm, I'm happy to twist the chairman's arm at, at MIT. I think if you, get 15, if you get 15 database researchers, one per top 15 universities, to just plain twist arms that we can make it happen. I think with, without a concerted, serious, one-on-one, -on -one, you know, on the ground effort, I think you're right, it just, it won't happen. But I think, uh, anyway, if I, thought, if I thought it could succeed, I would put my body against this. <laughs> yeah. Are, yeah. Are you proposing that people shouldn't write that many papers? Or are you proposing that when they apply, they should only identify a small set of papers? <coughs> I, I agree, but I think what will, the net effect is that if you can only put three on your resume, you will pretty quickly start writing three more substantive papers, and that means you won't you won't do the other eight, you know, lesser ones. So I, I think it will it will cause humans to do the right thing. I think. Anyway, if you have a better idea, I'm all ears. But I think. This, the, the current situation has just all kinds of bad implications. You, know, you talked about um, uh, how long it took to develop some of the software packages. Part of this, this symptom you're talking about, the fact that software, releasing software is not as valued as it used to be. No, I'm just, saying, I'm just saying that writing software, any software, is just plain hard. Yeah. If, 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 you know, and what we all do is we get software to the point where we can hook it together with bailing wire and, and produce a little benchmark. So we can make it work in a very carefully contrived situation. And that's sort of 5% of the work. If, if you want to get it so somebody else can use it, that's another 95% of the effort. And none of us go through that 95% because it's it's simply too much work, takes too much time, and doesn't allow us to grind out the you know, 40 papers for tenure. And, and I think it, it's always been hard, but I think you know, 30 years ago, for BSD, you know, Postgres, Ingress, there were a bunch of systems, Maxima, there were a bunch of complicated systems written in academia 
And that, that's largely, in my opinion, disappeared. And I think the reason is that paper expectations are, have gone way, way up. OK. So, so those are my three biggies, which is the hollow middle. We've been abandoned by our customer. And you're facing a paper deluge. Now, there are a whole bunch of, of fears that, that come from these three pretty much directly. So I'll go through those. First one is reviewing is getting very random in the database world. And it seems to me the problem is you've got this diarrhea problem, which means that every conference gets four, five, six hundred papers submitted. You've got a program committee of 200 or 250 people who are reviewing you know, five or 600 papers. And quality just plain stinks. It stinks because you've got huge program committees with an overwhelming crush of papers. And a lot of the reviewers are very, very junior people who don't really know what to look for. So quality stinks. And so if you write a paper, chances are it'll get rejected. And you then revise it and resubmit it to the next conference. All of us do this. And eventually, stuff gets in. And what that means is that every paper gets revised and resubmitted two or three times, which just increases the deluge. Uh, and it's killing both the submitters and the reviewers. So this is a no way to run a railroad. So I have a whole bunch of possible ideas. The first one is deal with the hollow middle. That'll, that'll make reviewing more focused and deal with the diarrhea of papers. Diarrhea of papers is just a biggie. And my real fear is if the current system persists, it will just collapse. Now, one possible solution is for every conference just plain to accept every paper so that every paper only gets submitted once. And you then have a program committee that uh, says this one is you know, very incremental. And you know, it, it simply goes into a database of accepted papers. You maybe give it a poster session. So you, you give speaking time you know, corresponding to the innovation uh, in the paper. Uh, so that would be another possibility. But I think cutting down the deluge is a much better solution. So anyway, I'm scared that the current system is just going to collapse. My next fear, uh, besides uh, you know, re reviewing stinks, is that as a research community, we're supposed to be the arbiters of good taste. And research taste, in my opinion, has completely disappeared. Why do I say that? Well, I'm just amused at the acceptance by the research community and then subsequent rejection of all kinds of stuff, most of which has come from the whales. So for instance, MapReduce uh, was the best thing since sliced bread in 2005 or so. It was written by Google, purpose built to store their crawl database you know, for their search uh, system. So we had a big brouhaha over whether MapReduce was any good in 2011. Around that time, Google stopped using MapReduce for the application for which it was purpose built, which is their, their crawl database went to Bigtable for all kinds of very reasonable reasons. So MapReduce was declared inadequate for the application for which it was purpose built. And a couple years later, in I think 2015, Google reported that MapReduce had no place in their stack for anything. So here's something that was pushed by Google as the best thing since sliced bread, and 10 years later declared you know, of no benefit to anyone. And I think I could go through all the other things that are on this list. But that's very typical. And it seems to me that these 
you know, why did Google write MapReduce? Because they didn't know anything about databases and they just wrote some stuff. And instead of us, say, and instead of us saying, wow, yay, Google thinks it's a great idea, so let's go, let's go write some papers on it, we should have said as a research community, these guys are out to lunch. And we didn't. And so I, I'm really disappointed that as a research community, our job is to be an ar the arbiter of good, of good taste, and we are really not doing that. And I could go on, you know, th there's a substantial list. The list comes from industry, and mostly it's bad ideas uh, driven by people who don't know what they're doing. And we let them, uh, you know, we let them get away with it, and we shouldn't. So we are way too uncritical of the whales who are usually uh, putting forward something for marketing reasons. And what will happen is that if we're not critical of the whales, then people who don't understand history will be condemned to repeat it. And we see this over and over again. And I'm getting tired of seeing the same stuff you know, over and over again. So how do, you, how do you get around this? Well, the biggest problem is that we are disconnected as a, as a research community from the real world of database users. They were perfectly happy to tell us that MapReduce wasn't interesting. All we had to do was ask them, and we didn't. So if, you wanna, if we want to reconnect with the real world, we have to recruit real world people to come to our conferences. That will require us to make conferences more relevant to the real world, which I think we should desperately do, and give them bribes, you know, free registration, whatever it takes to get, to get them to return. Otherwise, I think you know, research taste you know, will become increasingly random. So, Fear number six, which is, I think, you know, follows from the deluge of papers, is that if you've got to write, if you've got to write 10 papers as a grad student, 40 as an assistant professor, this drives quickies incrementalism, which looks like polishing a round ball. So we all do it. And my favorite example is, is there are a lot of DBMS papers which say, uh, I'm interested in problem X. Uh, the current solution, current best practice in solving problem X is algorithm Y. This paper has algorithm Z. Algorithm Z is 10% better than the previous best practice. And you know it's, it's a factor of three more complicated for 10%, but this is a publication. 10% papers aren't worth reading, and they're certainly not worth implementing. And all you have to do to realize is that this is to go spend some time in the real world and realize, realize that constructing complex algorithms, making them really work, is a lot of work, and no one will do that for 10%. So we're polishing a round ball which is pretty much follows from the required deluge of papers. Now, a unre totally unrealistic solution would be to force every assistant professor to spend a year actually in the trenches, not working for the whales, in the trenches of people who are, who are solving real problems. Of course, that gives them one less year to uh, re you know, meet the deluge of papers, but I think as a research community, we, we are pretty much disconnected from the real world. It'd be great if everybody spent some time in industry to figure out what those people really wanted. Okay. <clears throat> I was talking about this with Adidya earlier, and it's, it's just a fact. It's getting very difficult to get systems papers accepted in database conferences. Just one random vignette. Uh, a bunch of us wrote a paper 
we collected uh, some OL, you know, online transaction processing uh, system traces from a huge uh, Brazilian online retailer, basically the Amazon of South America. We got three months worth of their detailed traces of everything their transactions did. Uh, we fitted a predictive model to their real data and showed that we could uh, adjust resources in advance uh, that would, you know, we could anticipate load and, uh, and adjust resources in advance, either up or down. And it worked great and, and saved them a lot of resources. So we wrote this up in a paper and submitted it to a conference. And the one reviewer came back and said, well, you know, the problem with what you've done is it only applies to one, uh, one application. Why don't you create some fake data to, to come up with uh, some other uh, sort of, you know, quote, you know, real, real scenarios from fake data so that, you know, we, we understand how general your algorithm really is. And you feel like punching, you know, punching, your, punching the screen with your fist. So it's very difficult to get systems papers accepted, seemingly, seemingly because they have no theory. And you know, practical stuff is not appreciated by the theoreticians. And I don't see that changing. And so this will probably cause the system folks to divorce the traditional conferences. We'll see. And more generally, when we stop being driven by the real world, trying to make some, customer, some real world customer happy, then problem selection becomes arbitrary. And the best theory, of course, wins in that situation. So we're moving to a world where researchers make other researchers happy without ever trying to make a real customer happy. And that just makes, makes papers very arbitrary. So, and makes them, you know, have more and more and more theory, which I don't want to read, by the way. Now, a huge problem is if you want to do system stuff in the database world, where are you going to get real world data to validate whatever it is your idea is? The real world doesn't share their data. I mean, it just doesn't. Uh, why not? Uh, a lot of them consider their crown jewels proprietary. Uh, a lot of them won't do it. One, one very large uh, investment bank wouldn't share uh, their database crash, crash log because they didn't want to make their particular vendor look bad. And so there's political and, and allegedly uh, proprietary reasons for not sharing their data. But the real world pretty much doesn't share their data. The Brazilian retailer was a huge counterexample, which we considered a, you know, just unbelievable good fortune that someone was, was willing to do that. What that means is that system papers are becoming more artificial. They're driven by artificial benchmarks. Some of you may have heard of a thing called YCSB, Yahoo something something benchmark, uh, which is just an artificial, totally artificial. Uh, or things like data from Wikipedia, which is way off the beaten track. So it's a really ominous situation where you've got systems people who are trying to make things better for whom they can't find data to validate their ideas. Very ominous situation. OK, so my fear number eight. So this is driven by, again, the paper deluge and by the fact that we're be, we've been abandoned by our customer is that we're ignoring the most important database problems. By and large, as a field, we're working on what's easy and not what's important. And I think that's just terrible uh, long-term consequences. So just a couple of examples. 
A lot of you think data science is a great thing. Lots of people are working on data science. Well, it turns out I talked to a lot of data scientists. And the last one I talked to, which was a few nights ago, was a PhD machine learning person who worked for iRobot, the vacuum, automatic vacuum cleaner guys. And she said, I spend 90% of my time finding the data I need to do my ML on and cleaning it and organizing it. So 90% on Hmong work, which you'd call data integration. No one reports less than 80% on, on this topic, which means you're spending 10% or maybe one day a week on what you were hired to do and four days a week on getting the data and cleaning it. So the high pole on the tent is data integration. It's everybody's high pole. And by and large, as a database community, we are not working on that. And I think that's just sad. Uh, database design. Uh, if you pick up any textbook on data management, it will tell you how to do database design. You, you construct an entity relationship model, for those of you who know what that means. And then when you're happy with this model, you push a button. It spits out tables in third normal form. And you code your application against this set of tables uh, in uh, you know, ODBC or JDBC. So that's, that's what every textbook says. No one in the real world follows this advice. No one. Zero. So we are, we are disconnected from the real world at the very least because they are all doing something else and it isn't what we say is a good idea. Obvious problem for us to figure out where we messed up and fix it. So database design and evolution huge problem in the real world. And we are ignoring it, probably because we don't know about it. Tuning a database application is just way too difficult. The average database system has 100 knobs that you can turn to tune it. It takes a rocket scientist to tune those knobs. You know, making a database system go fast is not something you or I can manage to do. It's just too complicated. So we've got to do, you know, if you want to work on an AI ML problem, make these knobs go away, figure out how to set them automatically. And uh, so tuning is just way too difficult. And again, something we're just not working on. And it's, it's certainly the Achilles heel of getting, getting database systems to run fast. You need to have a four-star wizard to tune it up. Another thing that just galls me is that if you want to build a commercial production-ready database system, it takes at least $20 million in capital to get, to get, to get a database system to production readiness. That's just a huge amount of money. And in 50 years of writing database systems, that number is not going down. So we're doing something wrong that, that it's it just way too difficult to, get, to build commercial quality DBMSs. So here are some things that we are not doing that are incredibly important. And we're just ignoring them in favor of, and I'm not saying any of this stuff is easy. I'm just saying it's what's important. And we're working on what's easy. OK, so those are my main fears. Uh, and I would just say, in summary, a field is defined to have lost its way when it forgets who its customer is. And I think the database community has lost its way. And I'm scared. So. But I'm not nearly as scared of this as I am of the big enchilada, which is what I'm now going to turn to. And this is going to be a United States perspective. So if you look at 
who does database research. By and large, it's in universities, such as yours, all the other ones. And now I want to look at the quality of life of faculty in universities. So that's driven by availability of research money, since most of us have to pay our grad students. Uh, and then how much student overload there is. So I'll look at these one by one. So fear number nine is research support is just plain disappearing. The NSF success rate is under 7% right now. The number of mouths to feed is increasing. And our government is basically failing us. They are not supporting research uh, at a rate that is going to avoid us getting completely creamed by the Chinese. Industry is not picking up the slack. So government support is declining. Industry is not picking up the slack. Without a healthy, aggressive, and innovative research community, we are completely toast in the long run relative to other countries who are much more serious about uh, computer science research. It's kind of reminiscent to me of the Roman Empire. Uh, you know, that we're simply getting fat, lazy, and happy, and we are going to get completely eclipsed by people who are hungrier than we are. Uh, I was talking to Bill earlier. He thinks this will happen within 10 years. So get scared, because this is not some abstract thing off in the future. This is immediate. And without aggressive action in the short run, we're guaranteed to be toast. Fear number 10 is student load. Most CS departments are overrun with students. Now, you guys have a huge advantage, which is you, you, can, you have a filter. You can put a funnel on how many students you take. Not possible at MIT. And at MIT, more than 40% of all undergraduates are majoring in computer science, 40%, and going up every year. And so uh, we are overrun by students. The machine learning course has 700 students. <laughs> and it's just, you know, all the courses are just plain overrun with students. And this will make academic life less and less attractive off into the future. Just, we, we are being worked three times harder than every other department in the university. And that, that's just telling. And we are not particularly appreciated for carrying the load of the rest of the university. So what's going to happen for sure is the best people will depart for greener pastures. They'll make 3x the amount of academic salaries by going into industry. And this is going to have, you know, not only are we going to lose our lunch to the Chinese, but this is going to have an unknown impact on our ability to do research. What happens when the whales hire the best and the brightest of us? I call this the Donald Kosman effect, because he, he's a well-known DBMS researcher uh, who's now a vice president of something or other at Microsoft. So the, uh, I think I'm very scared that, that academic life is going to get less and less attractive, which means the best people are going to leave, which means that our ability to sustain excellent research is really questionable. Now, in my opinion, most of my fears are addressable. You know, you can do something about essentially all of these. And they all require hard decisions by conference chairmen, by you know, heads of SIGMOD, and so forth. So inspired leaders can do something. It's not too late. 
uh, to solve the 40, 40 the, cr the crunch of undergraduate CS majors at MIT will require inspired leadership from the president of the university. Not a common characteristic of university presidents, by the way, but we are working on him. So this paper, basically, the paper that goes with this talk, uh, that's in the proceedings of the Data Engineering Conference. This paper is a call for action, both to university presidents to completely restructure undergraduate curriculum. I think it's a shame that you guys have two computer science departments competing with each other. Uh, at, MI at MIT, we have five, so <laughs> you're not in bad shape. But, uh, you know, it's time to completely restructure undergraduate curriculum because computer science is essentially central to every other discipline and our whole university system just fails to recognize that. Again, it takes inspired leaders. Uh, and I think in the more mundane things of the deluge of papers and the hollow middle, it takes, you know, inspired leadership from the DBMS uh, powers that be. And this is basically a call to action to do something before the situation deteriorates further. That's all of my slides. I hope I've made somebody mad by now. <laughs> And you, can, you can throw the corn husks. <laughs> Most people probably can't hear me. I'll, I'll repeat your question. So first, I want to say I strongly agree with you that we need to change how we evaluate um, applicants for faculty positions and how we have to evaluate assistant professors with tenure to only focus on three to five people. I won't put an exact number, but I think it's the top most important papers they pro produced that should matter and nothing else at all. My question to you is, so I, and, and personally I'd be more than happy to try and work with the other top 20 department chair or heads and chairs to actually put this in place for computer science. I think that there is a pathway to do that, but the question is do you see that as realistic at MIT? Yep. And do you see it as realistic at any of the other top five or top 10 universities in as I said earlier, I think you know it, it's feet on feet on the ground at all twenty places to to just you know make this happen. I don't. I I see it absolutely. I see it very easy to do at MIT. Other questions? So, Danny, go for it. Mike, I have a question. Uh, so about the. Uh, the customer leaving fear. Um, how much of this would you attribute to the database community solving a problem too well <laughs> to the point where our real bread and butter, which is the database system, is, is fairly, um, a fairly uh, well developed beast and, and works pretty well for 90% of the cases? And so it seems to me that most of the people who are leaving, the customers who are leaving, are ending up at NIPS and ICML. And that's where all the action is right now. So um, one of my theories is that if we can, if the database community can corner data science and infrastructure and plumbing and tools around data science, we can attract those folks back to our conferences. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think what you, what you said is largely true, which is, we are a victim of our own success, which is our focus was to solve business data processing problems. We pretty much did that. Yep. And so, and so the, cus the customers who worried about business data processing said, I don't have that as a, a, as a burning issue anymore. Yep. So it's, it's time to make up a new, a new charge for the, the database community rather than just go to drift forward. Tandy. Oh, Tandy. My comment was going to be everything, you, first of all, I agree with everything you said, um, but everything you said was also applicable to lots of areas inside computer science besides uh, databases, for example, applicable to computational biology. So I think you're actually formulating 
uh, a really important critique that impacts many, many, many parts of academia. Well, I started, I started to proceed down this path. I said, this is probably a general problem. And so I went to talk to the operating system systems guys at MIT. And I, said, I showed my paper to them and said, you know, do you have any of this stuff? And they said pretty much no. <laughs> and, and so I think it's definitely, I think, a widespread problem, but it may not be universal. Okay, not universal, but widespread. I, I, I believe that. Uh, and I think it would be interesting to apply the shoe leather to go figure out how, just how, how widespread it is. So in the context of a new charge for the database community, right? so with Moore's law, coming to a crawl, the hardware architectures and the software stack changing underneath you, would you consider that to be a basis for a new charge? Well, I think there, there's, so the, the, que the question is, uh, what, would, what would be a charge for the future? And I think for the database systems folks, uh, the changing hardware landscape is definitely is definitely right up there. So I think I think it's easy to come up with several charges for these several different subcommunities. And I think it'd be. I, th I think I th my suspicion is that we could get agreement for five or six of these for five or six subcommunities. So but, can I just follow on sure. real quick? So, so I would I would. Um, suggest, request that, that you folks and the architecture folks get together and create a new charge together, which would probably be, you know, more powerful and impactful than each person. Yeah, I think a very reasonable suggestion is to say the traditional boundaries between these research communities no longer makes any sense. And we should rethink how, how we cut up the, the turf. I mean, I think that makes, but it's above that. That's above my pay grade to, to, to be able to influence. So, but I think it makes perfect sense to me. Jerry, hi Mike. You said there's a hollow in the middle. So from 20 percent of core database uh, in the conference now to 47 percent. To some extent, with so many years, it could be still be very healthy if you think you still have 47% of the paper work on the core problems. Because the application become bigger and bigger, likely they are going to take the, some room. Right? Yeah, I think, this, uh, I think the, there's still plenty of papers on novel hardware. I mean, I say the core, core, database, core database research is alive and well. It's just all this other stuff has nothing to do with that. And, and, and core database system work gets pummeled by, by the reviewers. Yeah, on the other hand, the splitting or outgrowth, or you can say spin-off, actually has been happening in the database community long time ago, not just the parts. You can see, like uh, data mining, originally was one core part of, or eaten part in the data, database community. And later get into the KDD conference, split it into SIG KDD. I think the SIG GIS also sort of split from the sp spatial database uh, finally into an uh, independent one. I think that, that kind of change may happen, and it could be very natural. I mean, that's what I'm advocating, yeah. is that we, sh we should just split into, into communities that actually agree on what, what the, what, what's interesting problems and what aren't. Yes. Yep. So do you think this meeting would lead to leaving off some of the customers that would very well come and present their ideas of work that would require DBMS concepts of you know, new kind of insights in DBMS? So I get the question was, does, would the splitting lead to problems in terms of 
people not listening to what the other sub-communities have to say, which may be relevant for their problem. What he was asking, is it possible to get real-world users to come tell us mm -hmm. what their real problems are? I think it's very easy. You know, you just ask them. And I think we, as a community, we just don't do that. I think it's also easy to find venture capitalists to come talk about what they think is important. Mm -hmm. So I think we just don't, we're, we're just too insular to, to worry about that. I think, I think it's a huge problem because you're welcome to go take an internship at Google and they make you sign an NDA that says, you know, that you won't divulge, you know, what their data is like because they view it as, 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 you know, the company jewels. And I just think it's a huge problem. I mean, I, I don't have a solution to that. Of, first of all, thanks for the talk. Much of it would apply to my area, which is networking uh, as well, including this problem uh, that we were just discussing of um, how do you know what's important to work on and get practically data to work on uh, that is from a broader sphere outside the whales. Because um, the the you know, hyperscale cloud providers, actually they do release some limited data sets in some certain cases, or they publish papers, but those aren't necessarily, um, they're, they're maybe taken as uh, uh, being more broadly representative than they actually are. Mm -hmm. um, so outside of those companies, how do you think we can uh, maybe even draw attention to the problems outside hyperscale cloud providers and also, you know, in practice, outside those large companies get, you know, data to work on. I think it's a huge problem because I think these guys all view this as their, as their, comp as their crown jewels. And, and that's the one thing I don't really have a solution for. And I think, but I think a good start would be for the whole computer science community to realize that this is a really important problem. And, and that, would, that would allow us to put pressure. And, you know, I think, you know, the Brazilian retailer who, who was willing to share their data with us, we might be able to pass it on. I mean, it's, it's messy and huge, but it, it's real world, it's real world transaction data. You know, it's what's in your shopping cart right now. So, so I think it would it would take a few a few brave enterprises, and then I think everybody would realize that their what they consider so proprietary isn't really that proprietary, and that the upside of getting some smart people to work on it far exceeds the downside of somebody realizing what they're really doing. problem with them getting whatever talent they can. Uh, that's, that's not at all my problem. They're, my problem with Amazon is they really don't do research. Their database, system, their database solutions are completely proprietary 
and sometimes not very good. And, and they engage in predatory pricing on their platform to protect their systems. I mean, they're, they're, and they don't share any data. And so I think, you know, as a research community, you know, you've got all these whales who, who say, I don't want to play with you. I'm not going to give you any money. I don't want to collaborate with you. I'm going to do my own thing and you guys go away. And that's, I mean, to me, that's just sad. Any other questions? All right, let's thank Mike again. <laughs> Mike, I'm supposed to give you this thing. Oh, thank you. There's a reception following the talk uh, that's outside. Please have a clean away.